you know, in life I had two lifelong dreams. One was to be a nun. And the other, <laughs> and the other was to be a mother. I achieved one and failed the other. I wanted three children by the time I was 26. I now have four. So I achieved, I achieved my goal with some assistance. So I'm a mother of four very interesting children. They're all unique in their own way. Um, they've given me teaching moments. They've brought out the best and the worst. You know, motherhood is a lot of things. Among those things is that it can be challenging, but it can also be rewarding. So I was just reflecting on some special motherhood moments. It was very interesting listening to my daughter talking about that. You know, she wishes I'd be calmer. And it was funny because quite often what I say to her is, you read me wrong. Because she will say to me, mom, are you angry? I say, no, I'm tired. And so now she doesn't ask, are you angry? She asks, are you tired? And usually it's yes. But it was interesting watching that because my son, who's not here, my 17-year-old son, he's very good at voiceovers. And sometimes you try and get my attention in his own way. And I was sitting down on the bed doing whatever I was doing, trying to be by myself. And he comes into the room, sits at the edge of the bed, and he starts doing his voiceovers. And he says all this. And I'm just ignoring him because I'm trying to do my own thing. But I couldn't ignore him anymore when he said these words. He was talking about me. He's like, these creatures are quite volatile if you try and get in their personal space. That got me. I was like, okay, yeah. So just some special moments about motherhood. When my kids were two, four, and six, when I still had three, I remember hiding on the floor of the car. I must have been exhausted. And all I could hear was, look behind the house. You know, and I could just hear them running, looking for me while I was lying flat on the floor. And you know, some people can relate to that. When you're a mother, going to the toilet on your own becomes a privilege. Doesn't it? You find yourself hearing voices in shopping centers and you're looking because everyone is just saying, mom, and it feels like they're addressing you, but they're talking to the other mom, right? Your handbag is no longer your own. It's just a dumpster for everything they won't carry. You prepare what you think is going to be a very powerful message. You're trying to prepare for Sunday. And all you have is somebody insisting on sitting on your lap with their iPad on full volume, watching something that is just, you know, contrary to what you're trying to do. And apparently, at my daughter who's three, at her daycare, I'm 22 years old. And at her school, I'm five years old. At least that's what was, what was written on the cards that they bring back, you know, from them. I'm five and 22. You know, one of the biggest lessons I've learned about motherhood is this. Motherhood is a ministry of the love of God. Motherhood is service to the family. Motherhood is a bridge between the family and the big wide world. Motherhood is advocacy for the needs of the children. It's an opportunity for compassion and kindness. Motherhood is the instrument, mothers, sorry, are the instrument God has chosen to use as the child's first teacher, that they must be carried and protected while they mature before they enter the world. That's what God has chosen. So I just want to pray for all mothers. Father, we thank you for mothers. We pray, Father, for protection over them. We pray for wisdom. We pray, Father, for all the sacrifices that they were not a waste. We pray for strength, and I pray this morning that as everyone hears this word, whether you're a mother or not, may you receive seeds of faith and bear much fruit in Jesus' name. 
Amen. You know, a woman was created with a womb. And that ena enables her to receive seed and to give life. Whether you're a mother in the natural or spiritually, you have a womb to receive. Before you're a mother, you're a woman. And the woman you are influences the type of mother you become. It influences the way that you carry the seed and the way you bring life. So the title of my message today, which you've already seen, is Woman, Thou Art Loosed. And that's taken from Luke 13, verse 10 to 17. And I'm reading from the King James Version, which I hardly ever use. It says, And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. This is Jesus. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he, said, he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed. And not on the Sabbath day. How dare you get healed? The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, that not each of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering. Sorry, I had to say it like that. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. In summary, what we're hearing is that while in the synagogue, which was the Jewish house of worship, Jesus spots a woman who has an infirmity, so a debilitating physical condition. He calls her and speaks over her, and she gets delivered from her condition. A religious leader, or the main leader, that he was not happy with this. And he made a point of making it known that he was not happy. Even though he was talking to the woman, he was also really talking to Jesus. Jesus is not happy with this response, and he calls him on his hypocrisy, which is one of Jesus' favorite things. He hates hypocrisy. So there's just some key points I wanted to highlight from this scripture. Number one, seeing the unseen. You see, Jesus sees the seemingly insignificant we can assume that like you and I, this woman was a follower of Christ. So we can put ourselves in her position. She was in the synagogue listening to teaching in the synagogue, just like you and I are here listening to teaching. But it says that he saw her among the crowds. You see, it was hard to miss her because of her condition. But I want you to know this morning, you are hard to miss to Jesus. His kindness and compassion caused him to stop teaching to attend to her needs. All eyes would have been on this woman, probably for the right reasons for the first time in years. Because this woman, other translations, she was bound over. So she was, you couldn't miss her. So she would have attracted a lot of attention throughout her life. But it says that Jesus called this woman forward, and she was willing. And so he spoke into her life. Our willingness to come when he calls makes all the difference. It's one thing for Jesus to call. It's another for us to come and respond to his call. You see, although people see the physical, Jesus sees all infirmities. Your infirmity may not be physical, but it's there nonetheless, by virtue of being a human being. An infirmity that has been there for many, many years is likely to make you feel shame, feel humiliation, loneliness, guilt, and condemnation. 
Anything that makes you feel those things and has been for many years in, is an infirmity that Jesus sees. Some of us have got thoughts that we have missed the mark. That we've not been a good enough parent. We've not been a good enough mother, father. We have fears that we've not prayed enough or led our children to the Lord. But God knows it all. Jesus sees the unseen. Because Jesus has compassion towards us. That's who he is. He is kind towards us. And he will stop for you the same way he stopped what he was doing for that woman. He will stop for you and I. That's what he does. You know, in the Bible, there are various ones that were afflicted by different things. And they needed Jesus' intervention. But listen to this. To the Apostle Paul, who had what they called a thorn in the flesh, which we're not sure what it was, it says three times he asked that that be removed. It said he was told, my grace is sufficient for you. To the woman at the well who asked for living, go living waters, it says that he, she was told, go and call your husband. Before Jesus could respond to her, he says, go and call your husband. She says, I have no husband. To the woman caught in adultery, he said, where are your accusers? To some, he said, do you want to be healed? To others, he said, what do you want me to do for you? But to this woman, he said, woman, thou art loosed from your infirmity. Why not just say, my grace is sufficient? Why not just challenge her to search her heart or just pray for her and leave it at that? I believe that Jesus addressed her most evident need at that moment, which was her physical infirmity. He set her free from bondage to her body's limitations. However, as usual, that was actually the final part of what he was really doing. Her being healed physically was the last thing of a series of things that he was doing. Because Jesus was a teacher. Even when he dealt with this woman and stopped, he, he stopped what he was doing, which was teaching in the synagogue. But he never really stopped teaching. Because he's always teaching. So now I want you to imagine that this woman is in the crowd he has been teaching, he stops because he spots this woman. All of a sudden, the attention now goes to this woman. So even though it looks like he stopped teaching, he hasn't. He's continuing to teach in a different way. Everything that he did up to that point played an important role in this woman's final posture, both physically and spiritually. He said, woman... He could just as easily have said, ma'am. He could just as easily have said, you. He could have said, believer. He could have said, Christian. He could have said, church. Thou art loosed. You are set free. So what I'm trying to get you to see here was that even though he was addressing this woman, he was addressing everybody in the crowd who would hear. You know, the Bible often says, let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. So a big lesson, number one here is, he pronounces deliverance over her. He pronounces deliverance over you. He pronounces it over me, over his church. And once he has done that, we get our second lesson, which is this. He came to destroy the works of the enemy. Oh, Claire, <laughs> nice one. He came to destroy the works of the enemy. 1 John 3 verse 8 says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. You see, Jesus knows and expects Poses Satan and his demonic forces because Jesus has victory over all. He can't help himself. 
he was not happy with the position of the synagogue leader. He advocated on behalf of the woman and he silenced that religious voice and the shackles that come with that thinking. Jesus is constantly trying to destroy, or not trying, he's constantly destroying the works of the enemy, especially that religious voice. So he becomes the voice for the voiceless. Every work of the enemy in your life will not always be obvious to you. But they will be obvious to Christ. And he will expose it because it doesn't belong there. The reason why I'm highlighting destroying the works of Satan is that that's what Jesus came to do, but that's what we should know as believers. Any work of the enemy in your life does not belong there because he has victory. If you're a follower of Christ, if you've given your life, it does not belong there. But he didn't just come for those who follow. He says, while we were yet sinners, he died. So our third lesson is this. It says that he called her out from the crowd. And so he distinguished her in that moment. He pointed out her identity as a daughter of Abraham. I was going over my head, why was that important? Why was it important that Jesus in his statement to these religious leaders, he points out that this daughter of Abraham has been bound by Satan. And it's this, a daughter of Abraham is one made righteous by faith. Because that's what Abraham was all about. So he could have just as easily said woman of faith instead of saying daughter of Abraham. But this doesn't just apply to women. It applies to everyone who follows through Christ. So he needed to set the religious, re religious leader straight that this one, this one is set apart. So it's important for us to have an understanding of our position in Christ, that there are certain things in our lives that we tolerate that we should not tolerate. Tolerate in the sense that we are like, well, it is what it is. If God wants to heal me, he will. If God wants to do this, he will. It's important to know the sovereignty of God. It's also important to know our identity in God and what God says about us. Galatians 3 verse 6 says this. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles, you and I, by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith, you and I, are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And so this highlights why Jesus had to point out this daughter of Abraham. He's saying there's just some things that should not be happening to you. So Jesus calls you out and he distinguishes you as a child of faith. You are distinguished. As a follower of Christ, you are distinguished. A believer with privileges that come with being a daughter of Abraham. Final lesson. The person who will carry seeds of faith to their final place of fruitfulness, because we have to carry those seeds of faith to a place of fruitfulness. They must walk with a posture of freedom. Your posture matters. It has to be a posture of freedom. When you have encountered Jesus, you can never be the same. Is that true? You can never be the same. You see, he gave this woman the ability and permission to walk differently, 
to think differently, to stand differently, and to run. Think about it, how she was physically. And then she was restored and she stood differently. And it says that she praised God. Why? Because the posture of freedom is continual praise. It's hard for God, for Jesus to touch you and you, never, you, you, you don't praise. Because praise is about approval. It's about admiration. It's about respect. It's about gratitude. It's hard for God to touch your life and you don't praise. She had 18 years worth of infirmity to praise for. She had 18 years where she could not walk. 18 years she could not have eye-to-eye conversations. 18 years of shame and feeling small and insignificant. 18 years of clothes that had to be altered to fit. 18 years of restrictions. Her praise in that moment, wasn't just about the fact that she is now able to walk differently. It was about everything that it took for her to be set free. And that is the lesson for you and I. Her praise was about the fact that he is our defender. He stood against the religious voice and he stands against the religious voice for you and I. Her praise was about the fact that he laid his hand upon her. Even though you may not always feel it or sense that his hand is upon you, even as you sit on that seat. Her praise was about the word that he spoke over her. The word that he spoke over her life when he said, Woman, thou art loosed. Your praise has to be about the word that he has spoken over you. If you never ever hear another word from God, Go back to the last word he spoke over you and praise him for that. Her praise was about his love and his compassion. You see, freedom has a posture that is completely different from bondage. Do the people around you know that you are free? Do they know that you have been set free or do they wonder? Do they know whether when you say you're a Christian, it means you have victory? The problem for a lot of us is that life happens. And when life happens, we get discouraged. We feel helpless. We feel hopeless. But you are free. So your posture matters. And the thing is, you don't have to manufacture strength. Because he is our strength. You don't have to manufacture joy because he is our joy. You don't have to manufacture anything. So before I finish, I just want to speak this. I I, I like poetry. So I've got a little something here. It's called, I am speaking to that mother. That first cry brought tears to your eyes. Most beautiful thing you'd ever seen. A bundle of joy, gift from above. Every moment precious, every movement captured. The toddler years brought their own challenges, but never took away the gratitude you felt. When they told you, mommy, you're the best, especially after their favorite snack. There's never a dull moment as life throws twists and turns. Most you could never have prepared for. Waiting in that doctor's surgery, wondering what will be said. Wondering whether you did something wrong while you carried that precious baby. Woman, thou art loosed. Dreaded phone calls from the school. Wondering what have they done now? Whose child has been hit and who will be blamed this time? My child, your child, their child. I'm speaking to that mother. The mother who thought like lock and key she and that child were meant to be. Woman, thou art loosed. When they're all grown up with no more interest in who you are, that born from long ago, a distant memory, you wonder if you did something wrong, missed something. Woman, thou art loosed. It never took much to melt your heart, and now it melts for scary reasons. Every moment is a prayer station. 
the anxieties and frustrations of not knowing what's coming next. As you lay awake with eyes wide open, hoping and praying, they're safe and sound. Will they remember all you have taught? Woman, thou art loosed. To every woman in the room, I say, woman, thou art loosed. Everything that would change your posture from that of a daughter of faith to a beggar for mercy, woman, thou art loosed. Everything that would cause you to think small, walk small, talk small, be small, the guilt, the shame, the condemnation, woman, thou art loosed. What would it mean for us if we took God at his word? It would mean this. It would mean that we believe that I am seen. I am protected. I am free. It would mean that we would receive by faith the words spoken over us. That indeed, woman, thou art loose from your infirmity. As a woman, as a mother, as a church. I want to finish off with this. We recently went to a conference in Brisbane, the National Conference. And the one thing that stood out for me was there was a theme that as the church, we have to reach out beyond the walls, the four walls of the church as we know it. You see, the religious leaders were comfortable in their laws and restrictions, but nobody was being set free from their infirmities. Some people will never walk through the doors of the church. They will never. It's too scary. It's too painful. It's too traumatic. But that does not stop you and I going out there and being the church. The Bible says you are the church. You know, at the conference, they talked about different ministries that people were involved in and one that stood out for me was where they rescued a two-year-old boy from child trafficking and another was when an organization called red frogs where they've reached thousands and thousands of high schoolers through lollies red frogs you see church is like a fuel station we come here we get reset, we get refreshed, but then we must go and do the work of the ministry. Because it says that Jesus gave the church, he gave them apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, to equip the church to do the work of the ministry. So we're here right now so we can refuel so we can go out. But what are we saying today? You're going out because as the church, as the bride of Christ, as that woman, you are loosed. You are free. No restrictions. 